Hi, I'm Tanya White, and today I want to speak about Pasha Balak. Very strange Pasha. It's a strange story about a king, Balak, who wants to destroy the people of Israel. They're powerful, he's worried, they're coming through his land. He doesn't think he can defeat them, so he hires a sorcerer, Bilam, to destroy them through mouth, through cursing them instead of blessing them. I think there are many, many lessons from this Parsha that are particularly pertinent to this moment we are in, in the history of the Jewish people. If we think for a second about the many enemies that have wanted to destroy us in the past, and we look even just a few stories earlier in the Torah, we see that there are incredible linguistic and thematical parallels between the story of Parol wanting to destroy the Jewish people and the story of Balak wanting to destroy them. As we've said many times before, there are many stories that interconnect between the first and the second generation and parallel in themselves in many ways. But there's also many differences between the first and the second generation. If we think about the first generation, we already said, almost like children, Hashem, God comes, he needs to, do, to save them. And in a way, faith is born out of these miracles that God does for them. What they can see, what they see is what they believe. If we also think about the way in which the enemy or the method, the mechanism the enemy, Paro, uses in order to annihilate the Jewish people, he uses the physical, the mechanism of physically destroying them, a genocide, making them work, laboring them. And in a way, God uses the same physical kind of mechanism to save them. He has his outstretched arm. He comes through the uh, all of the makot, all of the plagues. He opens the sea. But the second generation represent a very different model. They are what I would call the post-revelatory gener generation. They come after Har Sinai. They come after the miracles of the splitting of the sea. They live in a world where not everything is seen and understood through the eye. In fact, they wander in the desert for 40 years in order to engender a sense of the ear, listening, hearing, something that exists beyond. They live in a world where events might have maybe a slightly different hidden dimension. And in many ways, as humans, we have to use our interpretive capacity to determine what those dimensions are, what the, what the reality really is in front of us. With that in mind, it makes sense that each generation, the first and the second, faces different existential threats. The first, as we said, an immediate physical threat, and the second is a threat through this sorcerer, through this incantation, trying to curse them instead of blessing them. In the first generation, God saves them in front of their eyes. And in the second, the people are not even aware of God's saving hand. It all happens in an arena that the people are not aware of at all. The first generation is about the stick, annihilation through genocide. The, gen the second generation is through the mouth, annihilation through propaganda. Both of them, however, speak to the point, this ancient blight that existed for so many centuries, which today in modern terminology we call anti-Semitism, the hatred of the other. And the biggest question that I think we need to ask here in this parasha is how do we respond to anti-Semitism and to these efforts that all of these people have gone about doing to obliterate them, to obliterate our people? What does the story of Bilam teach us? What's the significance of the verse that he says, that we say every day in our liturgy, in our morning prayers, Matovu Alecha Yisrael. What's the meaning of the story with the donkey and the mountain and the tent? I want to suggest three main points that I think we can learn from Parshat Balak. Firstly, the story happens behind the scenes. Only after the event do we hear about it. Many of those things, many of the things that happen are actually occluded by the limits of our human perspective. Sometimes we will see them and other times we won't. But the biggest question is, can we open our eyes? Can we see the world? Can we see that there's things that are going on, that there is maybe a whole nother area, a whole nother level of existence that perhaps we don't understand and we don't see? 
If we look carefully at the text and the verses, if you read it and you see that there is a verb that keeps recurring and that is vitere, and they see, and they saw. We already saw that this verb occurs also in the story of the Muraglim, of the spies. It also occurs many other times in the book of Bamidbal. Like many of those narratives, the theme of sight is specifically um, appropriated in this moment because it teaches us a very important message. And that is, how do we look at our reality? Do we see everything as it is in the here and the now, this is all that exists, or is there a whole another dimension that might exist that we are not aware of? Are there events that are happening that we don't know about, that in the end will turn our entire destiny on its head? Again, the quintessential Sia, which is Bilam. He is, in Hebrew, the Se'el, he sees, right? He is the one who is the person who is able to see, is precisely the one who can't see, who needs to be taught the lesson of true sight. When he blesses instead of curses, cursing, he learns the lesson of eye and tova, of a good eye. Part of our challenge as human beings is to use our speech for the good rather than evil is to use the speech to interpret our reality for the positive rather than negative, and to understand that sometimes there are things that happen that are beyond our capacity as humans to see. The second major message comes through the story with the donkey. The story with the donkey is a bizarre story, and no, it's not a story out of Shrek. It's a story very simply, and this is the key, about loyalty. Bilam is taught a profound lesson by his donkey. If we think for a second, Bil'am, we're told by Chazal, by our rabbis, that Bil'am means Gli'am, without a nation. Now, in the ancient world, if you didn't have a nation, you were an anomaly. And that's exactly who Bil'am was. He was someone who serves only himself. He is not interested in the needs of others or in loyalty to anything outside of his own agenda, his own interests. And that is who he was, someone who didn't know or understand what loyalty is. He didn't know or understand what it is to be an individual in the matrix of connections and relationships to other. The story of the donkey takes place in a very narrow pathway. We're told you couldn't turn left or right. The donkey is the lowest of all the animals. And in that place, in this narrow place, the which, which by the way, signifies this idea of occluding vision of obtruding our vision the donkey says to be the donkey it, 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 it's not able to move and Bilam hits him it's really a mule Bilam hits the mule and he responds and he says to him I am your mule who have ridden on and been loyal to you all of these years have I ever done anything now to endanger you and Bilam turns to him and says, no. What is the donkey teaching him? Trust and relationship, being part of a network of loyalty, means that sometimes what looks like betrayal may actually be something else. And part of a relationship means we trust each other. It means we speak to each other rather than hitting them. It means we use words rather than force. It means we engage in dialogue and we see the good rather than the bad. The donkey, the lowest of all animals, the mule, the lowest of all animals in the most narrowest of places, is teaching Bilam, person without a nation, what it is to have loyalty to another, to see the other, to under to, to look with an eye and tova with a good eye, to have empathy, to say, why is he not serving me in the way he usually does, to use words and not just to pursue self-interest and power. Rather, to pursue loyalty, trust, relationship, and connection. That's the second message. Again, the first message, many things happen behind the scenes we are not aware of. What we see is not always what is. The second message of the mule is an idea of loyalty, is the idea that we are all part of something that connects us together. And living in a matrix of relationships is what gives us meaning and purpose and loyalty and trust. And finally, after Bilam goes to the mountain top, he goes from place to place, and every time they try and encourage him to curse. 
And he goes from one mountain top and he sees only the katser, the edge, the corner of the people. He doesn't see all of the people. And there he begins and he, again, he says to their, he says at that point, Hen am levadad yishkon. They are a nation that dwells alone. goyim lo And they're not thought of amongst the goyim. Why does he say that? What does it mean, a nation that dwells alone? And it's been used by many different people, many different thinkers, many Zionist thinkers, and even um, many thinkers today. The, the the basis of Rabbi Sachs's book is in uh, the future tense is Dafka, a protest against the idea of a nation that dwells alone. And it's this quote that this statement that Bilam says exactly at the point where he doesn't see everything. Where he only sees the katser, the edge, the corner, the extreme, the, the, the side of people that dwells alone. It really does feel at times as if we are dwelling alone. We have no friends. We only have enemies. But is that truly our destiny? Only later, once Bilam goes to the final mountain where this time he can actually see and we're told he sees the whole nation. Only there it says, God's spirit rests upon him. Only at that moment does he have a true prophecy from God. And there he says, How goodly, how beautiful, how good are the tents of Yaakov and the dwellings of Israel. The actual blessing comes not from being a nation that dwells alone, but being a nation when we see the whole people not just the extremes, not just the Katseth, seeing them dwelling according to their tribes, they each of them in their tribes, unique but united, diversified but together. And then he says how good and beautiful they are. Perhaps today more than ever, we feel this visceral, in our visceral experience of reality, we feel Bilam's statement, a nation that dwells alone. And in some senses, it's easy for us to lean into this kind of radical isolationist mindset. Or as Dara Horn says in the title of her best-selling book, everyone loves their Jews. It's true. We might think that. But that's only the corner of the reality. It's only the katser. It's the reality that we experience in that moment, in that vision. It's the reality we are in this moment feeling and deeply experiencing. But if we take a step back and we look at the whole perspective from the top of the mountain, we see that in fact, when we look down, we are all dwelling in our diversive, diversive tribes but we know that we belong to a people. We are loyal to the greater whole and we dignify the parts. And more than that, we see that there are moments in our history in which it looks like we are a pariah people that dwells alone. But actually, if we take a step back, we see that we are people who dwells beautifully, each in our own tribe and each of our tribes by respecting ourselves within our group we are able to teach the lesson of respecting others within their groups. Then, exactly as Bilam says to the people, we will rise up like a lion, and mivarecha baruch va'arecha aro, and we will; those that will bless us will be blessed, and those that curse us will be cursed. When we recognize that we indeed can be a blessing to each other, that we respect the tribes each in their own encampment, that we look to each other's tents and we see how beautiful they are, then we will also see that there are people in the world who bless us and we will take that blessing and we will be a blessing to others. Rabbi Sachs in his book, Future Tense, says, Jews have turned inwards, but they need to turn outwards. I've argued for a Judaism that has the courage to engage with the world and its challenges. Faith begets confidence, which creates courage. Part of the Jewish destiny is that we will suffer persecution. We will have enemies that will come and threaten us in conventional and non-conventional ways. But when we ourselves are strong, when we are loyal to each other, then we don't act like Bilam Bliam without loyalties and without a nation. When we speak kindly to each other, when we see each other full and falter, Rather than hit each other with sticks, just like Bilam did to his donkey, we show 
compassion to the other. And we recognize that even if in that moment we have fallen and we have faltered, and maybe we have even betrayed, we still throughout our long history have been the strength that has held each other up. And only then will we be able to transform the blessings, our blessings, into a blessing of the world and be able to take the blessings of others unto ourselves. And we will be able to engage with the world and connect with those that want to bless us. When we become a blessing to ourselves, we become a blessing to others. And that happens when we see beyond the given, when we understand there's more to the reality than what we see. And when we are able to say with sincerity, Matavu Olecha Israel, how beautiful are the tents of Israel. We need to recognize the beauty that we possess, and only then can we turn it outwards. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom.